everyone. We begin in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Today, we are honored to have a very special guest, Dr. Aisha Khan from the Lahore Ahmadiyya Movement in Islam. So Inside Islam is a monthly intra-faith series that Muslim Space has created for the purpose of focusing on the diverse communities of belief groups within Islam. And our purpose is to promote understanding, harmony, and cooperation within the various groups and to remove misconceptions that exist. These conversations happen in the form of short presentations by members of respective communities. And afterwards, we have a short question and answer session. So please, as you're listening to the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and we will address those questions after the presentation. So a quick introduction for Dr. Aisha Khan. She is a physician uh, for emergency medicine at Stanford University and a very devoted member of the Lahore Ahmadiyya movement. Uh, regular speaker at conventions, and she is also actively involved in improving the health of underserved communities in various ways. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan, for joining us today, for preparing this presentation, and we are eager to hear what you have to say. Thank you for having me. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay. All right, so I was asked to speak about the Lahore MDM movement in Islam, and specifically I was given uh, questions along the lines of who we are, what we believe, and then uh, finally, if there were some misconceptions that people have that we could remove, what would they be? So this is how I tried to lay out my presentation, um, but I also wanted to lay it out in terms of our name because it's a mouthful. Um, Lahore Ahmadiyya movement in Islam, it's long, but it is also each word carries a lot of significance. And so um, I'll use that to guide my presentation, inshallah. So first off is the word Islam. Um, we are Muslims. We believe in the expression of faith. There is no God but God or no God but Allah. And Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Um, it's the same core belief as the majority of Muslims. So um, no difference there. Um, and important to understand also is the implication of this, um, because beyond saying that this is an expression of monotheism um, or the basic tenet of faith underscores that Muhammad is the messenger of God, it also underscores the oneness of where we all originated from. And to say that Prophet Muhammad was brought for all people for all time um, underscores the universality of our religion. So our oneness and our universality. Um, it's universality rather than division. Um, and that is the core tenant of all of this, um, both I think this group, this meeting and um, our movement in Islam as well. Another verse that references this universality and the role of Prophet Muhammad um, is very central to one of the misconceptions about our group. And that verse is, Muhammad is not the father of any of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the Khatamun Nabin, and Allah is ever knower of all things. So the word Khatam means a seal or the last portion of anything. Um, and when the word is applied to a group of people, it means the last of that group of people. Thus Khatamun Nabin or the Khatam of the prophets means the last of the prophets. And therefore, the belief that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final prophet is clearly laid out in the Quran. Um, and it is also laid out in the Hadith. There's a really beautiful Hadith where um, it is said that the Holy Prophet said, my example and the examples before me is the example of a man who built a house and he made it very good and very beautiful with the exception of a stone in the corner. So people began to go around and wonder, why has the stone not been placed? He, the prophet said, I am the stone and I am Khatam and Nabin. So the, uh, the Hadith, the Quran very definitely, definitively point out the finality of prophethood. And um, so it is that the first misconception that we do not believe in the finality of prophethood is um, absolutely uh, untrue. Um, we do believe in the finality of prophethood. And there is also a misconception that perhaps we have a different expression of faith than other Muslims, and we do not. Uh, it is the Kalma Shahada, no God but God, and Muhammad is the messenger of God. Um, 
So Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who is the founder of our movement, did use the word Nabi in his writings, but he used it in the sense that it is used in Sufi literature very commonly. And he further went on to say, this is a long quote, so you'll excuse me as I read it. Be it known to all the Muslims that all such words that occur in my writings, Fatah Islam, Tawzi Maram, and Izala Oham, to the effect that the Muhaddas is in one sense a prophet or Muhaddasiyah is a partial prophethood or impartial prophethood are not to be taken in any in the real sense, but have been used according to the root meaning. Otherwise, I lay no claim whatsoever to actual prophethood. On the other hand, I have written in my book, Izala Oham, that my belief is that our Lord and Master Muhammad Mustafa, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him, is the last of the prophets. So I wish to make it known to all Muslims, if they are displeased with these words, and if these words give injury to their feelings, they may regard all such words as amended, and may read instead the word muhaddas. For I do not by any means wish to create any dissension among the Muslims. From the beginning, as God knows best, my intention has never been to use the word Nabi as actually meaning a prophet, but only to signify Muhaddas, which the Holy Prophet has explained as meaning one who is spoken to by God. Of the Muhaddas, it is stated that there's a saying of the Holy Prophet, among those that were before you of the Israelites, there used to be men who were spoken to by God, though they were not prophets. And if there is one among my followers, it is Umar. So therefore the prophet himself used this word uh, for the people in, within uh, his companions. Therefore, I have not the least hesitation in stating my meaning in another form for the conciliation of my Muslim brethren. And the other form is that wherever the word Nabi or prophet is used in my writings, it should be taken as meaning muhaddas and the word Nabi should be regarded as having been blotted out. Um, so in his own words, misconception number one um, is dispelled. Uh, so this expression of faith um, of the Kalma is that of all Muslims, um, and it is the universality and finality that is found in this expression of faith that drives the motivation of our group. Um, we are Muslims um, who were given the final message, but rather that, than meaning that, that, that we are any sort of chosen people, uh, what it means is that because the final message is for all people of all times, it's our responsibility to carry it forward. Um, just to further dispel any misconceptions, along with the shorter expression of faith, we also believe in the longer expression of faith, which is in all of the five pillars, um, as well as the um, tenets of all of the pillars, uh, I'm sorry, the tenet, tenets of the pillar of faith and the implications that this has. So Islam is a universal religion with one truth, guidance was always sent, we follow good inspiration, that's the belief in angels, and the last hour in the hereafter, you get what you earn. So now, now on to the second um, word in the title of our name. It is Ahmadiyya. And another um, thing that people say is that we were named after Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, who was the founder of our movement. That's actually not true. Um, he named us after the second name of the prophet. And these two names of the prophet, Muhammad and Ahmed, carry two meanings that are indicative of the two times in his life. Ahmed means the one who worships, and it stresses the Meccan period of the Muslims when they were a minority group, they were persecuted, and they spent their life in devotion. Prophet Muhammad was the first to bring the Islamic message to reform the people and return them to strict monotheism through this message. And the focus at that time is more, more sharply on worship worship in the quiet of, of the cave um, when he received divine revelation. Muhammad means the one who is glorified and it's more indicative of the Medina phase where there was community building, laws of society, defensive wars, and there was an equal existence with other religions in society. So that is the, the, the small difference and it's not by coincidence that we carry the name Ahmadi. The founder of our movement, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, had three claims. He claimed to be the Mujaddid of the 14th century Al-Hijra, and then he claimed also to be the Mahdi and the Messiah. 
So let's look at each of these claims. The claim to Majaddad is a common claim. Um, Allah tells us in the through the Prophet Muhammad in the Hadith that there will be a Majaddad send sent in every century. Um, at, a lot of these Mujaddads are uh, commonly known and accepted by all Muslims. The role of the Mujaddad is to bring humanity back to the central teachings of their religion. Um, you, uh, we all know that over time, things become infiltrated uh, and we start to adopt customs that are from our culture perhaps or from our history rather than strictly from the Quran. So the Mujaddad's duty was to carry uh, to bring back the people to the, the pure beliefs of Islam. This is a complete list of the Majaddads that have appeared in all the 14th century. And you'll see that there's some commonly recognized names like Mujaddad al-Afsani, who uh, is one with whose name the, the word Mujaddad is uh, commonly attached. Next is the claim to Mahdi and Messiah. These references are references to the Hadith, which talk about the Mahdi and Messiah in the terms of how Islam will be established in the last days. So we believe that these Hadith must be metaphorically interpreted. Um, the Mahdi is translated as the rightly guided one mentioned in the Hadith to establish faith. Um, the person, rather than having worldly kingdom or to wage war or bloodshed, we believe will um, gain dominance because of his spirituality and it is the spiritual spiritual attention that will be established in the hearts of people so that is sort of the domain of this um the establishment of islam is in in the hearts of people and it may be mentioned here that Hazrat mirza ghulam ahmed um, established a culture of reading and studying the quran of trying to regularly every day understand the quran um, through regular dars through regular study um, and this was, uh, in one sense, the fulfillment of the role of Mahdi. The role of the Messiah is also metaphorical due to the task of the Messiah. The Hadith regarding the Messiah says that the Messiah will kill the swine and break the cross. Um, and these are, you know, sort of things that are not respectful to the nature of a holy person of God to go around killing pigs and breaking crosses. So we believe that this is also... Um, interpreted in a metaphorical sense, as has commonly been done in um, the literature over ages, but it, it caused misunderstandings um, about the usage to imply that he was a claimant to prophethood in its literal sense. Um, it rather, this claim of the second coming of Jesus or Messiah um, is, is not one of being a prophet, but rather to his role. And we will get into that a little bit more um, later. So that's misconception number two, that Lahore Amdis believe that Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was claiming prophethood when he established his role as the Messiah. Um, that is absolutely not uh, the case for the Lahore Amdis. The Lahore Amdis believe in the finality of prophethood, but we also believe that God is not a silent God. Um, our God is a living God. So there's three kinds of revelation that are mentioned in the Quran. And if indeed it is true that we believe our God has not fallen silent, uh, what, how is it that God communicates with his people? So the three types that are message, that are relayed in the Quran, um, and you'll recognize these are one through the message of the angel Gabriel, which is the way that prophets received revelation when they were given a book or a law that was sent to their people. The second is a roya or a kash, which is a true vision or a dream. And there are people mentioned in the Quran who were not prophets that received this type of communication. For example, the mother of uh, prophet Moses when she was told to float Moses down the river. Uh, and then the last kind that is mentioned is an inspiration in the heart or an instinct that guides you. And this is mentioned in terms of the bee um, when uh, the Quran says, and your Lord revealed to the bee, make hives in the mountains and in the trees and in what they build. So what that means is that the first kind, which is through the angel Gabriel and is about receiving a law has, has ended forever with the prophet Muhammad. That's what the finality of prophethood means. 
And so anytime revelation, the word revelation is used in consonance with Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, it's to these second type, secondary types of revelation that we are referring and not revelation through the angel Gabriel. All right, so I want to quickly go through, I think, three beliefs that the MDs hold that are unique or different from the majority Ummah, because um, just to say that we believe everything is the same, we wouldn't really be a movement um, within Islam if, if that was the case. So here are the, the our sort of unique uh, beliefs on Islam that were uh, established by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. So one is regarding the sources of religion. Religion is derived primarily from the Quran, and we must return, the, return to this to practice a pure kind of Islam. The, this idea that the Quran, because it's in Arabic, can only be interpreted by certain people is one that we uh, try to dispel because we firmly believe that the Quran is the word of God and it is the word of God given to all his people. And so all of us should be able to use our intellect to try to understand with as much study as of the Quran as we can. Um, the Quran is the only thing that God has said that he will protect. Uh, many practices have been infiltrated otherwise, and the Hadiths weren't recorded until much after um, the death of the Prophet. So as it is a guarantee that Allah will protect the word of the Quran and the Quran has not changed, this is where the most pure practice of Islam lies. Um, the Sunnah of the Prophet is the second most reliable indicator of how to live our life. Um, we must remember that prayer is passed down from his sunnah. Um, sunnah has really withstood the empirical test of time. So passing through the ages, these are things that all Muslims practice regularly in, his in their lives. Um, and then after this is the hadith, which is the narration of, the, of his life passed through word of mouth. These are slightly less reliable, primarily because of the way that they were transmitted and how far after the Quran they were transmitted. And then lastly, lastly is ijtihad or collective reasoning. So if none of these things answer your question, then you must use your collective reasoning, your intellect to reason out what the right path is. Um, most importantly, if any of the sources of religion that are below the Quran contradict the Quran, it is the Quranic command that is the correct one. And we must consider that the Sunnah or Hadith has to be interpreted in light of that command in the, of the Quran, or perhaps it is not correct. Uh, the second um, belief that we hold is around the word jihad. And it regards this idea that jihad must be defined by its context. So jihad, the word means struggle. And as the prophet said, from returning from a de defensive war, the greatest jihad is against oneself. So what does that mean? It means that it's not actually a holy war with weapons, but it's rather a struggle. This shows us that the appropriate kind of jihad depends on the context. So in the context of the British subcontinent during the time of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, the Christian missionaries and the Hindu Arya Samaj were debating viciously with the Muslims of the subcontinent. They couldn't find any faults in Islam and so often made up lies and attacked the Holy Prophet. But because there was freedom of religion and because there was freedom of oppression in the British empire and in most modern contexts today, matters of religion were to be conducted with peace. There were many people who felt that we should raise arms against the British, um, but Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed said that in this case, because of the context, jihad meant discussion and debate about religion that should be rational and based on reason rather than emotion and, and uh, supernatural arguments. Furthermore, these arguments should be carried out with decorum and tolerance. Um, the Quran says there's no compulsion in religion. And in this vein, Hazrat Mirza Saab authored a hundred uh, more than 100 books, including small booklets um, and his main voluminous works. In addition to Islam, these books contain discussion about many of the major religions of the world. And in this sense, jihad was defined as being by the pen and not the sword. In fact, when asked if the British should be overthrown, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed made clear that despite their missionary goals, the British government allowed freedom. And so it was only jihad 
permissible uh, to be waged by a pen um, that that we could do and not by the sword. And this brings us to the third misconception that Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was a British agent and he changed the meaning of the word jihad. Uh, he in fact did not. Jihad has always been defined by its context. And I think um, as we switch to a more modern peaceful society, most of us um, have, this belief is more predominant in the majority of Muslims. Um, and this, the term of con the idea of contextualizing this term was something that the Prophet Muhammad did, um, not just Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. Um, and then, as I mentioned, another one of our beliefs is that Islam is a living religion, and God connects with His people even today. Uh, all humans can attain to spiritual greatness, um, and over time. Humanity tends to stray from the pure practice of the Quran. So Allah sends his mujaddads to whom he communicates to bring them back to the teachings of Islam. The next um, thing I will talk about is the claim of messiahship by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. So Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed received revelation in the sense of a roya or a kash, the two, the revelation that still happens today, that the second coming of the Messiah was not a literal return of Christ, but rather a metaphor. And that metaphor applies to a person who would reflect the life and teachings of Christ and perform the actions promised by the return of the Messiah. Uh, the hadith to break the cross is really metaphorical. It means to break the arguments that the Christians were using to um, convert the Muslims in the subcontinent particularly. And as Jesus brought a spiritual reformation to the Bani Israel, so too was Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed bring a spiritual reformation to the Bani Ismail or the Muslims. As the teachings of Jesus emphasized a return to the spirit of religion and peace and tolerance, rather than the fire and brimstone of the Old Testament, so too would the teachings and writings of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed and his followers call for a return to the spirit of Islam, conducted with peace and conducted with tolerance. The implication of this is that Jesus Christ is not alive in any literal sense, uh, as many Muslims may believe, um, but rather that he lived and died the life of any human. Second, it also means that there's no savior figure in Islam. No one will come through a supernatural force or a great war and re restore God's law on earth and vanquish the dis disbelievers. Rather, we ourselves are responsible for spreading the message of God, just making his message known to all people. And then it is up to them whether they accept it or not. So we do this through the teachings of the Quran and through books, media, discussions, open dialogue, and with other forms of religion and schools of thought, uh, we share our teachings with our practice and our example. We are, we are the ones who are responsible for ending oppression, speaking out against tyranny, restoring justice, lifting up our fellow human beings from literal and economic slavery. Another reason we believe this metaphorical interpretation to be true um, is that a belief in the literal return of Jesus goes against the idea of the finality of prophethood. Because if, if the prophet Jesus literally returned, he would still be a prophet or he would have to be demoted to something that's not prophethood. And um, that doesn't really um, honor or respect the role that he had. If the, hadith, if the hadith about the breaking of the cross and the killing of swine are taken literally, it would also mean that this prophet of God is in, engaging in conduct that we know is unbecoming. Um, and, you know, it's basically it's ruthless tyranny and murder. Um, so we feel, we feel that this belief, um, this hadith is actually filled in a metaphorical sense by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed because of his spiritual excellence, his works, the role he played and the work that he did. Okay, so now to the third word, which is movement. Um, movement implies that we are actually doing work that is the purpose of the existence of our group. We are not a club. Uh, we're not an exclusive um, organization. We are open um, and we are created for a purpose of spreading the peaceful teachings of the Quran. Um, and uh, it is the idea of bringing 
people back, both Muslims and uh, non-Muslims, to the teachings of the Quran through tolerant means like discussion. And primarily, we focus on translation of the Quran and its commentary into the language of common people so they can access the teachings and their own connection to God. Um, Hazrat Mirza Saab said, I would advise that instead of these missionaries, writings of an excellent and high standard should be sent to these countries. If my people help me heart and soul, I wish to prepare a commentary of the Quran, which should be sent to them after it has been rendered into the English language. I cannot refrain from stating clearly that this is my work and that definitely no one else can do it as I can or as he can, who is an offshoot of mine and is thus included in me. Um, so the, the translation of the Quran was actually done by Mulana Muhammad Ali, who was very close to Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. And it is this English translation and commentary with which we um, center our beliefs, our discussions, um, our um, spreading of Islam to other uh, people, countries, and um, languages. So uh, lastly is the word Lahore. Um, why is the word Lahore? Um, important. Well, the word Lahore is used to distinguish uh, our group of MDs from the larger Ahmadiyya group. And this distinction is based on two theological differences and one organizational difference. Uh, one, the Lahore MDs do not believe that Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad was in any sense um, a prophet that of the kind that receives a revelation from Angel Gabriel. So not in the sense of any of the prophets mentioned in the Quran. The Lahore Amdis do not believe that not following Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed puts anyone outside the pale of Islam. So if you call yourself a Muslim, whether or not you follow Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, we also call you Muslim. The Lahore Amdiya group also formed for the propagation of Islam and is governed as an association um, rather than as a um, uh, as uh, any other sort of like um, transitioning down of power through succession. So uh, it's an association, it's a meritocracy. So in summary, um, we are Muslim. Uh, we believe in the prophet Muhammad as the last and final prophet. Our purpose is to spread the true, peaceful, tolerant, rational teachings of Islam. And indeed the true, peaceful, tolerant, rational teachings of all religions, uh, which I think all religions get a bad uh, rap right now. Um, but for Islam, we try to do this through the translation of the Quran so that the people can access the teachings of the Quran and they won't be led astray by, you know, people who expound that terrorism is the right way or that any other type of insult or injury is the right way. Um, and we want to translate the Quran um, and other scholarship to the language of the people to do so. And lastly, we are a movement governed as a meritocracy and do not distinguish ourselves as a movement on the basis of a belief, but rather on the basis of the work that we do. Um, so at this time, I'd love to open up to questions. Um, I really thank you for listening. I know that that was quite a bit uh, and was kind of uh, detailed, including some of the quotes, but I'll be happy to sort of break things down um, as you guys have questions about them. Thank you. Jazakallah khair, Aisha. That was an excellent presentation, very detailed, very spot on to what we needed to hear and how to understand the movement better. We do have a couple questions in the chat. One question is that I've learned that the Ahmadiyya movement, and they, they're not sure if it's a traditional or the Lahore version, had a great deal of influence on the formation of Islam as a religion and movement in the Black community of America, for example, the Nation of Islam, is Dawah an important element of the movement? Yes, um, as, as I was uh, stating earlier, I think the even longer name of our movement is the Lahore Amdiya movement for the propagation of Islam. So it's in the name, um, Dawah is what we do. And the way in which we do it though is very important. Uh, we do it by handing the Quran to people in their own language so that they can read it and understand it themselves. And um, indeed, that's what happened with the founder of the Nation of Islam. Um, it was a member of our group that was taking the Quran and its English translation 
um, to the uh, to various um, places of incarceration. One of the people there um, read it and went on to establish the Nation of Islam. Um, you'll see even in the movie Malcolm X, the Quran that they hold up is the translation and commentary by Mulana Muhammad Ali. Jazak Elisha, that was an excellent explanation. And we have some members who want to ask a question. Shadi, I'm not sure. Oh, can you can people just unmute their mics and ask questions right now? Yeah, if you just want to call, I think Tabrez has a question. If I sure. would just let him ask it directly. Go ahead, Tabrez, please. Okay, hope uh, you can hear me okay. Apologize uh, if you can't. And uh, thank you for excellent uh, presentation. And um, my apologies in advance for being a couple of minutes late. So I may have missed uh, some key points from the start. And I'm going to try to ask this. So hopefully I'm asking in the right acceptable way as I'm just trying to learn. Um, thanks for sharing the perspective towards the end about um, some of the differences, I think, in the, in the community. Um, and I know your perspective is from the Lahore community, community, which I've heard is much smaller in size and has some different beliefs than the larger majority. In the community and so i know you mentioned some of the differences in beliefs but i'm wondering what brought about those differences and generally how do the communities get along and, and what sort of mixing is there both socially for marriage or anything else uh, i may have another follow-up question but let me ask that thank you uh, so, I mean, I, I will first say that I, I don't like to tell other people what they believe. So I can only tell you from our point of view why the split came about. Um, and I mean, no injury to anybody um, in uh, talking about this. The split came about because um, after the first president of our association, who was uh, Mulana Nuruddin, um, and was accepted as he was a um, very, very close friend and a follower of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed and was unanimously voted. Um, after that, there was a discrepancy, uh, which I called, um, you know, one of our, um, it, it wasn't really organizational, this was theological at the time. So should power pass to the son of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed or should power pass to, uh, someone elected by the meritocracy who was a close companion of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. So uh, the Lahore MD group um, with Mulana Muhammad Ali as the president separated themselves from the larger group, not based actually on the succession of power, but rather because the, the group that supported the passing down of power to the uh, son of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed had a different interpretation of the word uh, Nabi or prophet. And they, uh, and this is again, me speaking on their behalf. And so, you know, we, we separated ourselves um, based on the fact that their belief in the word Nabi was not a, a complete and pure reflection of the finality of prophethood. Whereas we believed in the complete uh, and pure finality of prophethood um, with the prophet Muhammad. Um, some, I, I believe in the larger MDA group say that, you know, it is a metaphorical kind of prophet, but perhaps you know, Hazrat Harun in the Quran was also this kind of prophet because there's no mention of a law given to him, but uh, we don't believe it to be so. Um, we don't believe that there's any change um, in the religion of itself, of Islam, and we believe the Quran to still hold completely true. Uh, and a further implication of this is that we don't believe that anybody who does not follow Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is outside the pale of Islam. And for this reason, even though we are a separate group, we don't separate ourselves in terms of marriage. If we were welcome in the mosques of um, anyone who is not a, a Lahore Amdi, we would go uh, because we believe ourselves to be al Sunnat um, and we, uh, unfortunately, are not really welcome in the mosques in uh, the subcontinent. So, um, and some places in the United States as well. But I will tell you, everywhere that I've gone, I've first gone to the mosque and uh, asked the imam if they would welcome people of our group there. 
And it, the only reason that I wouldn't go there is if they call a, um, a scoffer. Um, otherwise, we don't separate ourselves. And we definitely don't separate ourselves in terms of marriage. I think, you know, there's there's no rules for marriage in our group. Um, my, my brother is married to an MD from the larger group. So, um, you know, that, that happens as well. We are, there's also many of us married to the, um, to Muslims who are not MD at all. Um, I, I think, I don't know, is there, was there another part to the question? I, there was a few questions in there. Uh, thank you. Thank you for answering this. Very helpful. I think I followed most all of it is very insightful and helpful. Just the last part, I didn't understand the group. Are you referring to the group as in the Lahore, uh, Lahore M and the group compared to yeah. others? Yeah, the so Lahore. what I was curious about when you were saying, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, you were oh, curious. Sorry, just that. clarify. I, when you said going to a masjid, uh, yeah. when you were talking about going to a masjid and going to um, for marriage, are you talking in between the Lahore? Entity group and and uh, other no. entities, or are you talking about something else? Sorry. Yeah. So so yeah. So I think that that's a really good that's a really good distinction. Um. So I'm talking about um. So the lower MDs have separated from the larger MD group based on this idea of um not not um believing that Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was a prophet in any sense of the word and. Um, not believing that anybody who is who does not follow Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is outside the pale of Islam, and so for that reason we don't go like we separated, so we don't go to the mosques of the larger Amdia group, but we do go to the mosques of the rest of the Muslims if they welcome us. I guess that would be the easiest way to put it. <laughs> And sorry to take it back just for clarification purposes. Yeah. Ba based on what you're saying, I would assume that the rest of Muslims would welcome the Lahore uh, Emity group, but not so much the majority, the larger Emity group. And that's, I, I wanted to understand that distinction because when you're talking about going to the masjid, that's what I would interpret of what you're saying. Um, yeah. And it's a, you know, a curious question. I'm just kind of curious about it. Is that true? I would assume that is, but I may be off, and that's what I'm trying to understand. And thank you for clarifying. Yeah, clarifying. yeah no, uh, it's it's it is a confusing issue, um, and I think that's exactly one of the reasons why most uh, imams of mosques don't want to address it. So you hit the nail on the head when you said we're a small group. We are a very, very, very tiny, teeny, tiny group, um, and you know, I mean, I, I would say like maybe not even a hundred in the United States, uh, and in Pakistan, even uh, like few maybe thousands i would guess um but the other mdia group is much much larger in number um the declaration of being non-muslim was in the 1970 it was in 1974 in the constitution of pakistan and when those arguments were heard um whether or not we were muslim or non-muslim as though some government should get to decide that um the argument what the put forth were by the larger mdia group and from their point of view and so for the most part we are invisible to the larger muslim community uh, we're largely invisible to the larger MD community too um, i don't think a lot of them know that we exist um, or know about the theological or organizational differences um, and so it becomes difficult. And then when you try to distinguish that, no, we are Lahore MD and we are separate, most will answer with like, I don't know about your group or yeah, I don't know. It's just all, if you're a follower of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed and you know, most of the MD say he claimed prophethood. So we don't think that you are Muslim. And it, the, it sadly ends there and there's no desire to um, understand further. It's it's actually quite hurtful. Um, I know that uh, I have been uh, hurt by that. You know, after uh, two three years of medical school and being in the Muslim society and being very active. Um, Nine eleven happened when I was in medical school, so we actually were doing a lot of activism and and defending sort of the stance of Islam. And I was leading that um because I talk a lot as I'm sure you can see and uh yeah I was just kicked out of the group as soon as like the issue of MDF came up 
Thank you for sharing, Aisha. And we have a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. One is that we, it has been, some people have heard that um, Ahmadis perceive the story of Hazrat Bisa alayhi salam different from the majority of Muslims. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, so this is actually a central sort of component of where, uh, of, of the idea of the second coming of Christ being um, metaphorical. It's because we believe that um, Hazrat Isa was um, died and not that he died on the, the cross, but rather that when he was taken down from the cross, um, as the two people who were crucified with him were taken down, um, they were alive um, and he was also alive. They did not actually um, crucify uh, for the full length of time because actually it was like a, a holiday of some sort. So uh, Jesus, when he was taken down from the cross, was still alive. Um, he was taken into the cave uh, and nursed back to health um, by his companions. And so what is commonly thought of as being the resurrection of Christ when he came out of the cave was just that he was nursed back to health and uh, went back to his people. And there's a number of proofs that are delineated regarding this, um, including the fact that when Jesus left the cave, the story that is narrated in the Bible is that he was hiding in a cloak. So if, you know, he was some sort of supernatural figure, why would he be hiding in the cloak? Um, he needed food to eat. And, you know, that's something that all human beings um, need. Uh, and and I, there's, a, there's a lot of um, sort of proofs of this from the Bible and the Quran, and there's an entire book about it uh, that I can refer you to. But in brief, um, the, the purpose for which Hazrat Isa came or Jesus came was to find the lost tribes. And he went on to do this. Um, he traveled with Hazrat Maryam and some of his close companions to the region of Kashmir and died there. Um, there's also some archeological evidence of that having been the case. There's a um, famous um, a, a place where, uh, the, the people there say that this was the a sitting place of Hazrat Maryam, but we um, believe her to be buried there, um, as was Hazrat Isa. And so with this death comes the idea that there can be no physical resurrection of a human being who has died. Um, and so that's sort of central to the second part of this, which is that the second coming is metaphorical and was in the person of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. Jazakallah, Aisha. I have a question that you mentioned that Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, um, one of the reasons for the separation of the groups was that um, we believe that everybody else is a Muslim. Anybody who recites a kalima is a Muslim, and the belief in Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is not mandatory to being a Muslim, of course, since he's not a prophet, he's a reformer, came to revive their religion. And I'm I know that at the time when he came, there was a lot of kafir calling or the fear, you know, calling each other, removing each other from the Pale of Islam in the subcontinent. Can you share a bit about what he said about that and how he encouraged Muslims to be united? Um, I'm actually not totally sure what you're referring to. Sorry so <laughs> like people were calling each other non-Muslims, right, at that time? There was a lot of disunity among the Muslims at that time. So mm -hmm. Hazrat Mizal Allah Muhammad in, encouraged other people to have harmony, Muslims to have harmony, right? Yeah. And so that's what I was referring to. That it was, yeah. How did I mean, he encourage harmony among the Muslims? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of, one of the, the ways that we can see this to be true is the way in which he encouraged debate. Um, you know, he, he was very much a proponent of written debate rather than two people you know, yelling and screaming at each other or, or having um, their emotions get carried away with them. Um, and it was you know, in this light that he actually wrote many of his books. They were, they were in answer uh, to debate, including the philosophy of the teachings of Islam, which is an absolutely beautiful book that lays out um, how Islam is to reform not only the uh, physical and physiological conditions of human beings, but also the spiritual conditions of a human being. Um, 
so he he absolutely um, called for the unification of all Muslims um, and also called for them to unify against the, the external threat of the Hindu Arya Samaj and the Christian missionaries at that time. Thank you so much. We have another question is that you have spent some time explaining the differences between the mainstream Ahmadiyya and the Lahore Ahmadiyya movements. But how would you describe a bit more any differences between the Lahore Ahmadiyya movement and the mainstream Sunni Islam, if there's any other you can think of? Yeah, so those, those um, I think that I hit upon those uh, beliefs and I'll just summarize them really quickly. So amongst the uh, majority of Muslims, I think the first, um, the first thing that, uh, I mean, and, and this is actually not true of all of, so I'm, I'm talking about the majority of Muslims as a homogenous group, and of course they are not. But one thing we believe is that our God is not a silent God. Um, he is a living God and he speaks to his, uh, his creation still. Um, and when you purify your heart such that you are uh, worthy of receiving his communication, you, you could, um, you know, I, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was in fact, one of those people, um, who had done so. Um, so, but there's no like glass ceiling to the spiritual um, greatness that a person can attain. And so um, you should do so um, through the teachings of the Quran, which is another one of the differences is that the Quran is held to be the main source of religion. And it is the one that all Muslims are encouraged to go to. Uh, and if there is any sunnah or hadith, uh, that contradicts this, it's to be reinterpreted in light of the fundamental teachings that are in the Quran, or it is to be uh, considered as not being valid. Um, so that's, I think, a second common thing. Um, third is the belief in the coming of the Mahdi and the Messiah, which are referenced in the Hadith. Um, the Mahdi and the Messiah are both referenced in the form of, uh, in terms of like the last days of the world um, and the sort of, you know, dominion of Islam over everything else. This is actually what the, you know, terrorists often refer to when they refer to the Dar Salaam. But we strongly, I mean, very, very strict. This is like the core belief is that this dominance of Islam is not a dominance of, of physical or temporal greatness. It's not to have power and kingdom and dominion in the world. It is for the divine to have dominion and power and kingdom in the hearts of human beings. The, the spirituality of Islam is established by its beauty and not by its power. Um, and so these hadiths that talk about the Mahdi establishing dominion it's, it's a spiritual dominion. And the Hadith that talks about the Messiah coming down and killing the swine and breaking the cross, it's killing the bad habits, which is killing the swine because it's, you know, when human beings have bad habits, they are likened to swine. Um, and breaking the cross doesn't mean like physically tearing down churches because obviously we believe in peace and not even hurting somebody with the words that come from your mouth, let alone breaking down their place of worship. Um, because they believe that to be the house of God, right? So um, breaking of the cross rather means that we put forth these arguments for why Jesus is not a savior and is not the son of God, but rather it is up to every human being to save their own souls. Um, let me just reference my PowerPoint. I think I went over all of them. Sometimes I uh, I lose track. But, oh, and then jihad is the other one. So um, this idea that jihad is a, a holy war, um, you know, we, we know that the Prophet Muhammad contextualized the meaning of the word jihad as appropriate to the circumstances that they were in. And he said on his way back from one of their wars, we go now from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. The greater jihad is the everyday struggle of the uh, human being to um, quiet their own desire for uh, immediate um, uh, immediate gratification and rather you know to place the qualities of our spirit which are you know the qualities of the 99 names of Allah like mercy, peace, 
um, beneficence towards other people, nourishing other people, um, you place those um, above the desire to like eat yummy food or, you know, go get more things, get power, get greed. Um, you know, that, that sort of struggle is the struggle that the Prophet Muhammad was talking about at that time. And in the context of the, of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, the jihad that is referred to is um, the jihad of the pen, the, which means the laying forth of arguments um, and debate that will refute the arguments and debates of other religions against Islam, as the missionaries were really trying to do at that time. Um, I think those are the main differences. Zakallah for giving us a great recap. Aisha, uh, the raise your question. You have your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you again. This has been very helpful and learned a lot. Uh, I have a follow-up question on the earlier part you were talking about marriages. Um, and I'm, I've heard um, from my some interactions, and I'm not sure how much is true, but for marriage to someone in the MD community, I'm not sure if it's the Lahore MD community or the larger MD community, but that there's a form that uh, would be signed uh, acknowledging something. That's the extent of what I know. Um, and I believe there may be a difference if it's, let's say, someone that's a man marrying a woman. Uh, the woman being in the Amity community, man being non, uh, versus uh, the other way around. I was wondering if you could clarify that, or am I completely wrong? And did I hear something wrong? And I apologize if I did, but I, I would. I was thinking I would just uh, ask to clarify that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, uh, definitely not in the Lahore Amity community. There's nothing of the sort. Um, I don't know if uh, there is in the the larger Amity community. I will say that if there is a form, the only form that I can think of might be the, the pledge or the bet form, which is uh, if you wish to become a follower of Azad Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, um, whether in the uh, Lahore community, or well, actually at the time of, the, of Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, the way that you became one of his followers was not actually to pledge any sort of allegiance to him. The, there's 10 requirements in this form and they're all, basically um, the requirements of being a good Muslim, the primary one of which is to place religion above the world, um, at which means, or, or of, uh, sorry, to place religion above worldly desires, I should say. Um, and uh, I actually, I don't, um, I mean, I can pull them up right now, but uh, basically, yeah, okay. <laughs> I feel like it sums up the spirit of the Ahmadiyya movement so well. Yeah. That would help. Um, and again, I'm speculating um, as to what uh, you're talking about, that if there is a form. Um, so. Uh, Okay, so one, till the last day. Okay, so also this is a very genderized form. So it's he, his, him. Um, so we'll just, for the purposes of uh, this discussion and reading it quickly, um, when I say he, just assume I mean he or she. When I say his, it means his or her. Uh, one, that till the last day of his life, he shall abstain from shirk, which is associating partners with Allah. Two, that he shall keep away from falsehood, cruelty, adultery, dishonesty, disorder, rebellion, and every kind of evil. Three, that he shall offer prayers, salat, five times daily. Four, that he shall not inflict injury on any of Allah's creatures. Five, that he would bear every hardship for the sake of Allah. Six, that he shall not follow vulgar customs and uh, he will guard against evil inclinations. Seven, that he shall discard pride and haughtiness, live in humility and meekness. Eight, that he shall hold his faith, dignity, and the welfare of Islam dearer than his own life, wealth, and children. Nine, that he shall have sympathy for all of God's creatures and devotes his talents to their welfare. And ten, that he shall establish brotherhood with me. And this is very important. So not that he shall follow me, but that he shall establish brotherhood with me, a fealty. Um, obeying me in all things and firmly adhere to these rules until the last breath of his life. 
So um, if I can repeat any of them, but as you can see, all of them basically underscore the duties of a Muslim, um, both to God and to their fellow human beings. Zakallah khair, Aisha. So to, we're reaching the end of our time, unless there is any final questions. I wonder if you can share links to any of the Lahar Ahmadi websites. So if people have further questions and they can follow up and get any more information, because the whole purpose of this series is to open up the conversation. I feel like we don't want to talk to each other. We don't want to ask questions directly and get information. Instead, we're relying on hearsay. Or talking behind people's backs and you know giving judgments about them, and that's really yeah. harms the unity of the Muslims. It really, it's just a horrible thing to do to anybody. So the purpose of this series is to open up the conversation and to realize that we can dialogue with each other. We can ask questions. We don't have to agree on every single point, but we can agree to disagree and respect one another. I think the Riz has one final question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Again, just trying to learn. Uh, and I'm not trying to I'll lead by saying I'm not trying to generalize, but I'm just trying to learn with uh, a, a positive view, I think, of the folks I've met from the Amity community I've found are very highly educated. Uh, and so I say it in a commendable, positive way. I'm wondering if there's um, a reason, but I found a very large percentage, uh, very highly trained, very professional, very educated. Uh, which I find very commendable, but I was just wondering if there's some correlation, is there something based on the beliefs or is it just happenstance? Uh, thank you again for all your explanation. It's been very helpful. Yeah, sure. Thank you for your questions. Um, so I think that, you know, during the time of Azad Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, his teachings appealed to the intelligentsia of the subcontinent. Um, it's as simple as that. Uh, his arguments, uh, the way he laid forth his debate, um, at, at attracted um, people who were intellectual. And by no means do I, am I referring to people who were like well-established or had a lot of power necessarily. Um, Mulana Muhammad Ali himself was a lawyer, but he completed law school and never practiced law. He devoted his entire life to religion. Um, so, you know, it's not that these were like the wheelers and dealers of the time. It was, it's just that they were the intellectual people who were attracted to his teachings. Um, you can see the appeal of uh, somebody calling for peace, rationality, tolerance in a world that was dominated by might is right, right? So not only the British empire, uh, but the Hindu Arya Samaj and also the Muslims of that time were all calling for war. Um, and then amongst that comes a person who is saying, no, like religion is not about war. Religion is about the reformation of the self and about service to humanity. And so that is a message that I think appeals to people who are engaging their intellect. Um, and also, you know, his, his arguments were all laid out in writing, right? So like his books, his pamphlets, um, it was people who were able to access these uh, and read them. And then there's there's plenty of people that may not have uh, an education in the sense of a worldly education, but still have a spiritual education and uh, followed him because of the example they saw in him, those who were lucky enough to be alive during his time. Um, and I, I think that that has persisted. Um, the Lahore Amdia movement, even though it's very small, uh, does have quite a bit of the intelligentsia of, um, I would say, Pakistan at our time and uh, probably in the United States as well. So um, that's, I, I think, that's the only explanation I know of. Thank you again. Thank you. Aisha, I have heard people say that Ahmadis are just metaphorical, that like they're, they take everything metaphorically. And I think, um, like you explained it, that it's more about being rational and logical, understanding Islam through that lens, which may be another reason. Do you have anything else to add to that, you know, that misconception that we take, that Ahmadis, or I'm also an Ahmadi, so I said we, take everything metaphorically? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the greatest way to refute that is that Allah says himself in the Quran that, you know, he revealed the Quran as a guidance to us. And some of its verses are decisive. They are the basis of the book and others are allegorical and those seeking to mislead 
um, would interpret you know one as the other and so in that light I would say the decisive verses of the Quran are very clearly laid out you know do not kill reflect ponder um, pray and pay the poor rate there's they're they're very simply laid out that's the basis of the book if you are talking about stories that are supernatural or seem like fairy tales you have two choices one of these choices is to believe that there either used to be some great magic in the world or that there's magic in the world right now that we're not seeing um, and anytime you you tend to think that way I think the impetus is to take the responsibility away from us right so if there is saviorship there is magic if something supernatural is going to happen then we don't have to do it um, and tempting as that might be, I mean, the, the, the truth of the matter is the metaphorical or allegorical route is much more difficult because it places the responsibility on us um, to, you know, in a sense, save ourselves, um, to be the saviors of, of humanity right now or around us. You know, I, and I'm not just talking about religiously, I'm talking about economic op oppression, I'm talking about tyranny, political oppression, like to engage your entire life in those tasks, like that is jihad. And that is, you know, metaphorical or not, allegorical or not, like that much more fulfills the spirit of the Quran than the idea of going out and murdering people because they don't believe in the same religion as you. That was a beautiful explanation, Aisha, and it brings our discussion to a close. Thank you so much. I know how busy you have been and how much effort went into this presentation. Really, really appreciate it. Let's just finish by adding the links to websites. If you're okay with giving out your email address, I'm gonna put yeah. mine over here as well. If anybody has any follow-up questions, we yeah. are open to them. Um, so I will say that I don't think necessarily that um, our website right now is very well laid out. So all of the information is there, I'll put it on here. Um, but it's kind of difficult to sort through. Um, there's actually a Wikipedia link that is that if you just want basic general information, I'll put that on here too. Um, it kind of lays out uh, our beliefs. Um, and I think it's kind of like easier to follow. Um, but you know, any you you'll be able to distinguish us from the other group because we put Lahore in front of our name all the time. <laughs> And you know that like we we are very um, very mindful of that distinction. Whereas if you only see Ahmadi, it probably means the other larger group. Thank you so much. This has been extremely informative. I hope that it was your maximum effort to clear up any misconceptions and give just a true as it is picture of this movement. Thank you so much, Aisha. Thank you for all our present our participants who took out time from their evenings to join us, ask questions, were open enough to discuss this topic, which many people just run away from. Thank you. Allah be with you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakat. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, everyone. Assalamu alaikum.